Hello and welcome to Elector Engineering Insights, the show that puts your engineering challenges to the industry's experts. I'm your host, Stuart Cording, the electronics reporter. This is a special episode that looks at two areas of the semiconductor industry that are driving massive innovations. The first is wide band gap semiconductors, which are changing how power converters and motor inverters are designed. It's driving improvements in efficiency, size, reductions in heat dissipation, and making the previously impossible possible. The other is in sensing technology. These devices are more than just a sensor in a black package these days. Advanced analog is being coupled with digital to offer highly integrated solutions that open up new choices for design engineers in everything from industrial and automotive to consumer electronics. I spent a day at two of the country's leading trade fairs to learn more about both these areas. PCIM, covering power electronics, intelligent motion, renewable energy and energy management, and Sensor and Test, the leading forum for sensor, measurement and testing technology. I started at PCIM talking to Carlos Castro from Nexperia to learn about their new E-Mode GAN FETs. But first, I asked him to explain the difference between E-Mode and D-Mode GAN. Okay, let me start uh, saying that we as Nexperia, we believe in the coexistence of both technologies, E-Mode, and D mode. Uh, we believe each technology has its own sweet spot in terms of applications requirements and so we will see, we believe, both technologies uh, in the market uh, having their own uh, area as well. E-mode, it's a technology where the devices are normally off, um, while D mode devices are normally on. That means you have to uh, do something to make it normally off. And the way we do it is integrating a low voltage uh, silicon MOSFETs in the package so that the overall device, it's, it's a normally off. The customer is using a normally off device with all the benefits of, of, of GAN there. Now, Nexperia has had D-mode GAN devices uh, in their portfolio for some time, but here at PCIM, you're launching some new devices. Tell us about those. Yeah, so we are launching uh, seven different uh, products uh, in uh, three different voltages, uh, 650 volt, 150 volt, and 100 volt in four different uh, packages. And so we believe with these first uh, seven products, we can already cover a wide range of uh, applications, uh, mainly in consumer and uh, industrial market. But we are already working on the next generation and we will soon as well offer new products as well in E-Mode to, to our customers. So these E-Mode GAN devices, uh, what benefits are they bringing to the power market and the designers using them to implement what types of applications? So basically, uh, we offer what everyone is looking in the power semiconductor industry, meaning uh, increasing efficiency, uh, improving the, the power density, and at the end of the day as well, reducing the overall uh, system cost. And let me give you just some, some examples. We did some uh, estimations uh, with a, a USB-C uh, charger, 65 uh, watt, and there, replacing silicon with uh, GAN, we could increase the efficiency by around 2%, power density 55%, and at the end of the day, uh, as I said before, the very important uh, factor of the overall cost, we could reduce it by 25% for the whole bill of material of the system. Well, those are really impressive numbers, obviously, and, and people be interested to understand how that's implemented. And of course, here on the show, you also have some demonstration or evaluation boards. Tell us what those demonstration boards uh, explain to potential customers. Right, so for both, for D-Mode uh, and for E-Mode, what we offer to our customers are a bunch of uh, evaluation boards, uh, double pulse test boards. And basically, what those uh, boards are helping our customers is to evaluate the technology immediately. They can uh, evaluate what is the switching performance of the devices, things like uh, switching losses, oscillations when, when, when switching, uh, but as well the thermal behavior, for example, of, of the device in, in operation. So we try to make our customers' life easier 
by accelerating the design phase and those boards uh, are helping them uh, with, with that design. Yeah. Now I've got one last question before we leave you. Now, as these um, power supply technologies are being introduced, one of the benefits we get from them is the higher switching frequency because that's what allows us to use smaller um, coils um, in, the, in the design and achieve that higher power density. But obviously the challenge there is controlling that gate voltage and obviously circulating, circulating currents, high frequency noise. Uh, what's the sort of um, the challenges for using E-mode and, and keeping control of that gate voltage? How much playroom do we have? That, that's right. Uh, as I said before, each technology, D-mode and E-mode, has its own uh, benefits and, and drawbacks. And one of the challenges of uh, E-mode is uh, a relatively uh, lower uh, threshold voltage in, in, in the gate. Um, that means when you go, for example, for very high current uh, due to oscillations when, when switching uh, off the device, you could have some uh, parasitic uh, turn-ons. Um, that's why um, we recommend for higher power applications where you have uh, very high current to use D-mode, things like in automotive onboard chargers, for example, and when it goes to low current, low power applications, E-mode will give you the best performance and, and cost ratio as well. Well, thanks ever so much for giving us that update on the E-mode uh, GAN devices that you're launching this week. And we look forward to chatting to you again in the future and find out what sort of applications and markets you've uh, been uh, deploying them into. Thank you very much for your questions as well. Yeah? Most engineers love to hate documentation. Every supplier is different, the graphs are challenging to use, and the specific combination of parameters you'd like, beyond room temperature, simply aren't there. I spoke to Chris Boyce of Nixperia to find out if we are ever going to get beyond PDF data sheets. Yeah, that, that, and indeed that's exactly what we are announcing uh, at uh, PCIM this year. Great to be back, by the way. Good to see you again. Um, yeah, so uh, building on the, uh, the thermally compensated precision uh, uh, spice models that we introduced last year, um, those have been very well received and uh, getting glowing reports from our customers in terms of uh, making sure that the simulation uh, matches the, the, the lab results. Um, we've now taken that a stage further and built on top of the, 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 the spice models um, some interactive data sheets. So uh, our customers no longer have to rely upon uh, a static PDF black and white document. Um, we now have uh, a, a fully interactive uh, um, 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 uh, uh, digital version of the data sheet where our uh, customer engineers are able to move uh, sliders around and vary the, the, the conditions under which the parameters are specified and see those parameters change in real time um, uh, exactly to the test conditions that they're most interested in. Because we all know, generally, we're not running at room temperature. We're running at an elevated temperature. So, uh, so if I'm an engineer looking to specify a, a new component, take us a little bit through the process. Am I, am I just downloading an interactive PDF, or what's the experience? It, the starting point is exactly where you would start today. You would go onto our website. You would. Uh, maybe use the parametric search table or one of the, one of the tools to, that, that we provide to, to come up with a short list of devices. You then click on, the, on that device and you go to what's called the product introduction page, the PIP page. And that's what, exactly what you would see uh, normally today where you can download a, a, a PDF document, you can order samples, you can see all of the chemical composition of the device, etc. But there is now a new button right next door to the download, download data sheet button that says download in interactive data sheet and you click on that and a new window will open up and you get something that looks very much like a, a data sheet all the same information but this time with um, uh, with the sliders on the various parameters um, and uh, yeah the, the whole thing is responsive to whatever conditions that you put into the into uh, um, uh, the, the page now one of the challenges challenges with a traditional PDF data sheet is those graphs um, plenty of lines, but they're quite small. And if I'm looking for a, to understand, let's say, the RDS on value at a particular temperature or under a particular voltage condition, I almost have to print it out, get my ruler, and, and start marking on the page. Um, yeah. Has that changed in the interactive data sheet? Yeah, it's changed in two ways. So, firstly, if you take the 
the RDS on um, uh, value, uh, which does change with temperature or it changes with gate voltage, what you would have to do is go down and find the graph where, where you get that relationship, as you say, get your ruler out, measure up and across and multiply and uh, come up with a value. And you can do that, uh, but now you can do that just by moving a slider and all of that work is done for you. And you can set multiple things at the same time. So on a PDF data sheet, you can look at how RDS on changes with temperature, or you can look at how RDS on changes with gate voltage. You can't look at how the RDS on changes when both of those are varied. Now right. you can with the, with, the, with the interactive data sheets. On top of that, when you actually want to look at the graphs, and so rather than just have, uh, marking out with your ruler, if you just hover your mouse over the top of the, the, the graph, then the, uh, the values will automatically pop up and you can just read them out and, and put them into whatever documentation that, uh, that, that uh, you're working on or into your design calculations uh, straight away. So uh, yeah, a lot, again, a lot simpler. It's, it's all about how do we make it easier for our customers to design in our MOSFET devices. Now, how far are you along in rolling out this uh, new approach to data sheets? Uh, uh, is this just a handful of components that support it at the minute? So this is version 1.0, um, but it's not, a, it's not a, just a demo, it's not a, not a beta test, it's, uh, it's live, and we've already um, uh, released uh, something like 150 um, uh, devices. There will be uh, up to 200 very shortly over the next, uh, the next week or two. Um, so uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're it's absolutely uh, you know, rolling this out now against our, our latest and greatest MOSFETs. Um, but it is only version 1.0, and I'm sure uh, our customers and your viewers will find ways to use this technology in ways that we haven't yet envisaged. And I would really welcome uh, people to try it out and, and, and give us some feedback. What else would you like to see uh, in this type of environment? I know we've already had some feedback, for example, that people would like, once you've manipulated the sliders and got it into a particular um, representative uh, uh, model for your uh, application, they then want to be able to download with the with those uh, parameters set. So that's that's something that we'll put into version 2.0. But there's lots more we can work on, and uh, we really uh, hope that uh, uh, we get lots of good feedback and uh, we can try and incorporate as many of those uh, features as possible. Well, it's a very exciting project. It's great to see something other than a static data sheet at, at last on the market, yep. and I'm sure it'll be much appreciated by the engineering community. I really hope so. Wide band gap is not all about GAN. Silicon carbide or SIC is the alternative and sometimes competing technology. Suppliers like Toshiba are already several generations in with these devices. I spoke to Armin Derbmans and asked him where they are on their SIC MOSFET journey. So we are introducing uh, the third generation SIC MOSFETs at this show. We first released that earlier this year. Uh, now we show the first real implementation using those devices and showing their individual benefits, such as the high levels of reliability that comes across with the built-in SOTI paradigm. So it's really developed for those kind of applications that need that kind of uh, way of implementation. Now one of the big challenges at the moment in the industry, and we've, we've seen it over the last couple of years, is the supply chain. Yeah. Um, how do we make sure, or how is Toshiba making sure that we've got enough uh, capacity there, enough fab capacity mm -hmm. to get these products uh, to engineers designing them? Yeah, of course we take notice of the increasing demand coming across from various applications and the immobility and the charging related applications, renewable energies drive the demands to very high levels. And last year we have already decided to invest into a 300 millimeter line in Japan. So we're going to produce those things in Japan and that's going to be the supporting that demand that comes uh, out of those kind of growing applications that could give us that kind of demand. Now obviously uh, power devices are all about efficiency, about power density. Uh, what areas are you seeing at Toshiba as being the key applications that are going to benefit from SIC technology? Well, it is, uh, as we show that example application in the SIG cube is EV charging is one of the big topics. And um, we are trying to really create, uh, for example, reference designs uh, that help us getting familiar with all the implementation related issues. When you talk not only performance, you talk about power density, you talk about cooling. 
And as a semiconductor supplier, you should not only make the components, you should also make an implementation and be familiar with all the implementation related issues. And that's what we did with the Secube, so we burned our fingers on that, but finally we got a very competitive 3D implementation uh, that shows how you can make use of those latest generation of Secubes. Of course, it's not enough to deliver parts. Semiconductor vendors need to develop their own understanding of the challenges in turning these new technologies into real-world applications. I asked Toshiba's Matthias Ordman to explain the capabilities of their 22 kilowatt SIC cube demonstrator. Uh, this is a SIC cube, a 22 kilowatt SIC cube. Uh, it's a three-level PFC and it's connected to three lines, which means uh, three phases and it's then converting to a DC-DC, well, it's converting to DC voltage and uh, yeah, it's uh, able to handle 22 kilowatts. It's based on our third generation SIG MOSFETs and um, yeah, we have decided uh, to use um, a modular approach. Modular approach means if you have a look at the uh, circuit of a totem pole PFC, you can see that you can separate uh, an inductor board at the beginning connected to the line and a capacitor board at the output. And these boards are available at um, DC-DC converter and uh, inverter. And therefore we decided to uh, also design um, the switching part, which are the bridge leg boards, as modular approach, which means we have not uh, had, uh, implemented a complete V6 bridge, but we implemented three separate bridge leg boards on, and on each of these boards is a dedicated bridge leg, which is uh, or which can also be used for uh, switching applications in inverters and in uh, DC DC converters. So, what are some of the challenges around this modular approach? How do you make sure that the currents flowing through the board are <laughs> appropriately handled? Yeah, as usual, bomb costs should be uh, as cheap as possible. Um, but unfortunately, if you have, uh, for example, a cheap PCB technology you cannot handle 32 amps. And if you want to do this, um, but have to have uh, easy uh, um, PCB technology, you need to have some current rails. So we decided to use a four uh, layer PCB and current rails, which means copper current rails, on top and bottom of the PCB. Now, one of the aspects of the board when I look at it is it's connected by those um, sort of chrome uh, board spaces. Yes, um, you're totally right. Personally, I'm a little bit worried. It scares me a little bit, but uh, is, is that a secure way of, of mechanically and electrically handling that much current? Because of our three-dimensional approach, we can use these uh, um, silver uh, metal uh, uh, current rails uh, to connect the boards. And I think because they are screwed, they are really, really safe and even better than gluing them with uh, or doing some, some thin connections. Yeah. And therefore, I think they are most appropriate for this application. Now, in these types of applications, they're controlled by a, a digital microcontroller in order to monitor the voltage at the input and the output and control the, um, the three phase bridges. Um, what microcontroller are you using and why have you chosen that particular one? Yeah, we have, using, uh, we have used our M4K microcontroller of our M4K uh, family. This one is basically uh, designed for motor control. But if you compare motor control to um, the PFC application, you can see that you need PWM, you need ADCs, and additionally we have a vector engine inside. And this vector engine allows you to offload the, PCB, uh, the CPU, which is a CR4, and calculate stuff like um, transformations, Clark and Park and in its birth, and additionally the sine cosine calculation can be done with it in parallel to other parts of the algorithm from the, uh, from the CR4 inside. And therefore it's a good combination and powerful combination to achieve high switching frequencies, PWM switching frequencies. This episode is sponsored by Transfer Multi-Sort Electronic. Also known as TME, they are one of the major global distributors of electronic and electrotechnical components, workshop equipment, and industrial automation. The company employs over 1,300 people at its headquarters in Poland and has subsidiaries in 11 other countries. TME serves 230,000 customers from over 150 countries and ships 5,000 parcels a day.
Among the 600,000 products they have available, customers will find solutions from over 1,400 manufacturers worldwide. If you're looking for something for your project, drop by tme.eu today. Thanks to its high-speed switching capability, GAN has already changed the power adapter market with USB chargers and laptop power supplies taking advantage of the higher power densities they can achieve. At the GAN system stand, I started by asking Paul Wiener to explain the range of GAN devices they supply. So we have an EHEMT GAN based technology, GAN on silicon. Um, we have two product ranges, a 650 volt product line and a 100 volt product line. Within those, we offer the broadest range of operating current as well, low power to high power, which allows us to service all the variety of mar uh, markets and applications that you see here at the stand, from consumer and low power, all the way up to industrial and automotive and high power. Now the, the market is obviously looking for alternative ways of gaining efficiency improvements and wide band gap technology is the way forward. What are you seeing in terms of um, what's generating revenue today and what sort of design in, is going, activity is going on in the future uh, now, which will show us what applications will be using GAN in the future? Yeah, it's, it's a really uh, dynamic situation right now. From a revenue perspective, as many people have seen, these GAN chargers for smartphones and uh, laptops. Um, we also have a lot of customers now um, using our GAN devices for Class D in, in audio, um, as well as we're seeing a very good pickup uh, of adoption and production revenue in the uh, data center power supplies. Now engineers have spent many years refining their topologies around traditional uh, silicon uh, MOSFETs for power converters and motor inverters. What are the biggest challenges that they're having to transitioning to GAN, and what approaches are they taking to move into a GAN-based design? Yeah, so we've really made that easy for customers with our reference designs and application notes. Um, and, and what we see is the way customers adopt our GAN is those first designs will be on the conservative side. Um, they will operate the GAN at not peak uh, switching frequency that, that would give them optimal performance in the design, um, but they stay more conservative to get comfortable with the technology. And then what we see when they move to their second or third design, they'll start to increase the switching frequency and really take full advantage of, of what GAN can bring. Now, this stand is incredible. It's like an engineer's playground. There's just demo boards and examples of technology all over the place. I think everyone's having great fun seeing what's here. Could you uh, give us an, an, a guide to sort of your top three demos here and explain sort of what makes each one special? Yeah, absolutely. So one thing we're really proud of here is being able to show how customers are using our product. So that in combination with the solutions we bring to market really makes a fulfilling uh, total stand. So some of the highlights uh, this week are a DC to DC converter from one of our customers that um, is designed to operate at both 400 volt and 800 volt. Um, as well as we've got a reference design here of an 11 kilowatt onboard charger also at 800 volts. Um, and then the third thing that's really exciting is what our customers are doing in data center with a continuous, as I mentioned earlier, they're getting more and more aggressive with GAN as they learn about it, um, a continuous shrinking of that power supply down to sizes we didn't think were possible before. Well, it's really exciting to be here and see such a range of demonstrations, uh, demonstrators available with GAN inside. Thanks ever so much for guiding us through what's here. Yeah, super, thank you. Even within the world of wide band gap, differentiation is already taking place. High frequencies coupled with new topologies mean that new issues arise, and because of the challenges involved with controlling the gate of a GAN device, there is a risk of accidentally switching it on. Steve Oliver from Navitas started by providing a summary of how GAN has developed and how it's shaped their product range. Yeah, thanks, Stuart. It's a great example, actually. Um, gallium nitride, new technology, really the silicon chip 
for processing power is dead. And with GAN, the industry has gone through a series of upgrades. We've gone from the old-fashioned depletion mode, which is the normally on device that you have to cascode and do very complicated things, then to enhancement mode with normally off devices. But then you still have the weakness of the gate to overcome. So with Navitas, we have the unique integrated approach, monolithic integration of a GAN driver and GAN power MOSFET. So it's a really robust, high speed, high performance building block. Now that overcomes a lot of the challenges that engineers have with controlling the gates, it makes them a bit reserved, I think, when it comes to doing their first GAN designs. Um, how do your customers sort of approach that move from uh, a topology using silicon that they trust to move into attempting something new with GAN? Right, that's the, the Leonardo principle. So Leonardo invented the helicopter, but couldn't make it fly with wood and cast iron and string. But with the new technology, we have things like the active clamp flyback, patented in 1995, but only in production in 2018 because of GAN and because of the power IC. So really it's all about a, a designer thinking with a clean piece of paper, what can I do? And really, you know, we deliver easy to use digital in power out building blocks that they can then focus on the system, not how to control the Navitas part. We make it easy. Now you've got a great range of examples, evaluation boards, and actual customer pro products here today. What would you say are your top three highlight products and what makes them so special? Well, we started with the actually uh, creating the GAN fast charger market, um, starting with aftermarket and then going into Dell, Samsung, Lenovo, these kind of people. And then from there, it's really branching up in power. So now it's in home appliance. It's uh, washing machine motors, it's vacuum cleaners, hair care products, using integrated half-bridge GAN power ICs for three phases in a motor drive. You can also throw in lossless current sensing, two kilovolt ESD protection, under voltage lockout. These things will detect and protect within 30 nanoseconds for a short circuit. They're really very strong devices that make the system more robust also. There's obviously, yeah, we've seen a lot of these applications already out on the market, the, the chargers for mobile phones for fast, fast charging, we've seen uh, adapters for laptops. Um, what, what are we going to see in the next year or so that's been developed in the background that isn't visible today? That's a great question. The first thing is for the data center market. In Europe, the European Union has said that every AC-DC power supply for a data center has to be what they call titanium plus. That means the peak efficiency has to be greater than 96%. And using gallium nitride, our customers have been able to exceed the efficiency spec in a system that's half the size of the old silicon version and according to them, has a lower system bomb cost. So you'll see a lot of data center, say one, two, three kilowatt applications. After that, it's solar microinverters. So using gallium nitride to go from low voltage DC to the AC, and then in 2025, you'll see GAN power ICs in EV. We have an example here today of a three-in-one charger going from AC to 400 volts DC. Also 400 volts back to AC if your house power goes, and then you still need to go from 400 volts to 12 volts for your battery. Yeah. Sorry, for your battery, and then radio and navigation. So these are the markets we'll go into with GAN power ICs. It's a very exciting market, wide bank gap, in, in, especially the, the GAN technology that's going on. Thanks for giving us an update to what's going on. Thanks very much, Stu. Because of wide bank gap like GAN and SICK, the demands on passives are changing too, because the operating parameters are different. To find out more as to what these changes are and how suppliers are responding to them, I drop by Knowles Precision Devices. I asked Chris Nyad how they differentiate their components from the masses. Well, Knowles has been in the business for a long time, uh, but we've always focused on being, uh, I suppose, a niche supplier, more a specialist supplier. So we focus on high voltage as our, as our prime uh, approach. Yeah. Uh, and that's really kept us uh, ahead of many of our competitors. So we're perhaps smaller than some, but we have a lot of expertise in that, uh, in that area. Now, wide band gap is obviously a massive theme at PCAM this year. We're seeing lots of SIC, lots of, of GAN technology. Um, that's bringing in new topologies, much, much higher switching frequencies, but at the same time, designers are starting to understand I don't really have the passive components I need, or then they're, they're not 
useful in these applications anymore. Yeah. I need something new. Um, so what challenges are is wideband gap causing to the passive components? Well, we're seeing the higher switching frequencies. Um, we're seeing higher voltages, higher temperatures, and these are all sort of stressing the existing components. And um, so designers are looking for for components that are going to go beyond the current uh, uh, performance levels, if you like. So we focused on electric vehicles as one of our main areas. So we have automotive grade in all of these uh, components. And so high temperature means up to 250 degrees, high voltage up to 12 kV. Uh, and so I think the, the combination of the various different parameters of the capacities will meet uh, most of those requirements. Now, passive components, maybe people don't quite understand. They've been around, obviously, for a much longer time than, than semiconductors. Um, where does the innovation come in passive components? What are you looking at? Is it the materials that are making the difference, or is it the structures and the manner that you're putting the components together that makes the difference? Well, essentially, it's both. Um, I think we've got a lot of experience in our team going back many years, perhaps many more years than they'd uh, care to admit. Um, so we, I think on the material side, we're continually looking at uh, development there. We have our research uh, facility in the UK, uh, and that's, uh, we're looking at new ceramic materials. We're also looking at um, the designs, the internal designs, and again, that's based on a wealth of experience. You can change the internal design to better meet the voltage requirements. So I think it's a combination of both of those things, and we did have some unique and some patented uh, products. So yeah, I think it's uh, both of those things. So one of the examples we've been talking about today is um, in a sort of like the, the piezoelectric effect on, on some capacitors which can, can destroy them, but you've had some innovation in that space in order to improve that problem. What came out of, of that research and, and what, you know, what have you done to solve the problem? Yeah, this really came out of the aim of making a smaller footprint, which means a thicker capacitor, uh, certainly higher. And the, the challenge there with X7R is the peak so stress at a certain point, the high voltage will break the capacitor. So we thought, well, how can we relieve that stress? So we developed this special layer in our Stachycat product, which relieves the stress. So we have perhaps three layers within the capacitor to reduce that. It means you can have a much thicker capacitor and therefore a smaller footprint. So this has come out of the material design and a knowledge of how the capacitors behave. Uh, and that's been very successful. Now, bearing in mind engineers are currently challenged with selecting passive components, um, there's obviously lots of questions. How do you support your customers in firstly selecting the right components and then maybe using them on the circuit board in the appropriate manner to meet their needs? Yeah, I think we, we try and make ourselves accessible. Uh, so that's through our sales team, internal and external, external. But we have dedicated applications engineers and they have uh, gained a lot of experience in many different applications from uh, electric vehicles, space, defense, medical. Uh, and we, can, we know how those capacitors behave. We don't know the circuit itself, perhaps, but we know what the capacitor will do given the frequencies, the temperatures, the currents, and so on. Um, so we can actually look at how they behave. We can do testing. We'll put thermal cameras on parts. We'll put the right power supply attached to that capacitor. But we can tell the engineer, look, this is perhaps an alternative way of doing it. We would suggest trying this component or this layout. Um, and it's really that knowledge of the behavior of the component it means we can give the best advice. But our team is is there to support, is, um, does, a, does a great job, I must say. Well, thanks very much for those technical insights into passive components, and we look forward to seeing what other innovations appear in the coming years. Thanks, Stuart. With plenty of power questions answered, it was time to walk across the halls to sensor and test to explore innovation in sensor technology. I started at analog devices to explore a new multi-turn sensor that not only retains position when turned off, it can even track changes when powered down. With plenty of AMR angular sensors on the market, I asked Ender Nickel how this new device is different. Yeah, well, as you, as you mentioned there, there's, there's plenty of uh, angular sensors on the market today, but they all have a limitation of one rotation or 360 degree measurement range. So yes, yeah, so analog device have come up with the very first single chip multi-turn and angle sensor solution. It has a measurement range of four to six turns. Uh, it's called the ADMT4000. And it, uh, yeah, it combines an AMR angle sensor to give it the precision 
which uh, is about 0.25 degrees of accuracy. Um, that's combined with a GMR spiral sensor, um, and that's how we get the, the, the multi-turn information. Now that multi-turn information, do I lose that when I power down the device, or is it, does it somehow manage to retain that information? Yeah, no, the, the sensor works on a, a magnetic right, electrical read principle. So as long as you have a magnetic field within the uh, range that, that's, that the sensor requires, uh, in front of the sensor, the sensor will operate with that. So it, it doesn't need any electrical power. So it's basically power, contactless and powerless. If you like. Now, are there any interesting requirements around the magnet in order to make this sensor work? Yes, uh, the, the, the GMR uh, spiral, if you like, the magnetic window, you need to operate it in a window of between 16 and 31 millitesla. Um, if you go below that, you're in danger of some miscount because there isn't enough energy to move what we call domains around the, the, the spiral. Uh, and if you go higher than the uh, 31 millitesla, you're in danger of uh, resetting, resetting the sensor. So, uh, and in fact, that's how the sensor gets reset. Uh, typically, when you assemble it into, into the final assembly, you should reset it um, just to make sure there's been no distortion during transportation or that. So, um, yeah, that, that, that's, that's the basically the, the window that it operates within. So what sort of applications are you expecting this type of sensor to be deployed in and, and how, how is that different to the, the way that the, those applications are working today? Yeah, so typically today in rotary to linear actuators in particular, you would uh, you'd typically need a linear transducer or linear position sensor for closed loop control. So by putting the, uh, the uh, multi-turn sensor ang and angle sensor at the end of the motor shaft, for example, you've got not, not only the shaft angle information, but you've got the multi-turn absolute information. So you can effectively eliminate a linear transducer uh, in a rotary to linear actuator. So that reduces the size and the weight and the cost of the actuator significantly. And uh, also another way, uh, in other applications, sometimes gear reduction mechanisms are used to reduce the number of turns down to a single turn so that you can track the absolute motion with a single turn sensor. Right. Again, we can reduce, the, completely eliminate, in fact, the gearbox or the gear reduction mechanism in combination with a single turn sensor, uh, offering the safe space saving, weight saving, and again, cost reduction of the overall solution. Yeah. So um, in order to use this, obviously, we want to get that data to a microcontroller or some other part of the system in a vehicle or an in industrial piece of equipment. What sort of interfaces are available? Yeah, it has for the industrial market, we have SPI is the is a normal interface, so it's a SPI output. And for, for automotive applications, we have a SENT, SENT interface on the chip as well. So yeah, so it gives it provides a digital out, zero to 16,560 degrees uh, of absolute measurement range. And in terms of, um, cap uh, sort of programmability or configuration, what sort of configuration and calibration capabilities are built in? Yes, it has internal calibration capabilities to remove some of the mechanical uh, misalignment issues in the assembly, also some defects with the magnet itself. So yeah, we have on, on board, on ship, if you like, uh, calibration capabilities within the chips as well. Yeah. Now for engineers looking to integrate this into a, an application, they say, no, oh, that's just the sort of thing I was looking yes. for. What do you provide for them to get started? Yeah, so we have uh, evaluation kits. Um, it has come with a magnet and, and the, uh, the sensor and evaluation board, the GUI and, and so on. Uh, we also have samples available, uh, pre-release samples available. And uh, yeah, we can also provide support on the and help of customers with the magnet design if they're not familiar with designing magnets to operate within the window that the sensor operates within. So yeah, it's all, that's, all, that's all part of our support model. Well, thank you very much for that great introduction to this multi-turn uh, multi talent. Thank you. And I suppose for more information on the sensor, you can contact or visit analog.com forward slash magnetics and uh, you, can, you can request more information on the product there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Semiconductor vendors typically restrict themselves to evaluation and development boards, but unusually, analog devices have been putting their sensors together into a product for the world of industrial IoT. Gaetan Azergi introduced their wireless AutoSense product that can detect pending electrical motor failure for condition-based monitoring. I asked him about the sensor technology they've integrated. 
So analog devices has already a strong portfolio in uh, semiconductors for vibration sensors, temperature sensors. Uh, we did even uh, some uh, custom uh, magnetic flux sensor. And uh, we have now diversified on uh, software also. Now you've just uh, developed your first uh, industrial sensor for predictive maintenance. Uh, it's a sensor that actually fits to a motor. What exactly is that sensor measuring? How is it powered? And how does it sort of transmit the data that it collects? So the first approach for this topic, electric motor uh, condition-based uh, maintenance and uh, predictive maintenance for this, uh, has been to have a wireless battery powered then uh, sensor directly connected attached to the motor and it measures uh, vibration, temperature and magnetic flux to have a complete overview and complete understanding of the magnetic behavior of the sorry of the motor's behavior. So um, obviously predictive maintenance the, the big buzzword around that is then the machine learning or the uh, artificial intelligence part is that done inside the sensor or is that done elsewhere as part of a broader system? You're right. Uh, predictive maintenance and machine learning are two big words actually, currently. And we are using machine learning directly on the cloud. So currently this technology provides all the data on the cloud and we're using machine learning technologies directly on the cloud to adapt our diagnostic as uh, close as possible of the real life use of the motor. Now every electric motor is different and even if I had two of the same electric motors, if they're connected to different systems, they're going to have some sort of different response in terms of vibration, heating under load and also the, the electrical uh, characteristics of the motor. How does your system then learn what a correctly running motor is? So during the first week of installation of our system, we are collecting data and only connecting data to make sure that our model, anomaly detection model, is as close as possible to the real life use of the motor. If during this first week a big anomaly is detected, we are cancelling that and we are asking to provide a good maintenance of the motor before doing another learning phase. Now in many of these types of systems, the, the people who are installing it and using it actually have to set, set some sort of parameters to say where the, the limits are. Is that also the case here? No, thanks to machine learning technology, we are fully automated. That means that during the installation, all you are requested to do is to enter the parameters provided by the nameplate of the motor, if it's present. And uh, from there, the machine learning will do the rest. So you don't need a motor expert to install our system. All the setup and threshold uh, for notifications will be automatically uh, set up. Now the sensor itself, as you've already described, isn't just a standalone system. It sends the data via Wi-Fi to a, a cloud service, and obviously that's a, a big system. Is that something that engineers are going to access directly from analog devices, or is this a, a technology which you're going to distribute through partners? So you're right, it's all about partners. Analog devices uh, is positioned as a technology provider for this market, and we are building currently our partner network for smart motor sensor. Fantastic. Well, thanks ever so much for that inter introduction to predictive maintenance and sensors. It'll be interesting to see what comes up in the future uh, around this technology. Thanks a lot. Radar chipsets have moved from esoteric semiconductor materials to silicon, rapidly bringing down the cost and opening the technology up to new applications. The startup Sikno has been exploring its possibilities in healthcare and looking at how to support those wanting to get into radar. Fabian Michler started by explaining their origins and experience in the field of radar. Um, so we're a spin-off of the University of Erlangen Nuremberg and we are dealing with radar sensors which we develop for different customer applications. Um, if a customer needs a radar system for a specific application, for measuring uh, distances or angles in industrial or consumer um, applications, then we can provide a tailored radar system. And what we also do, um, we develop uh, evaluation boards for radar systems for different application purposes, for example, for vital sign sensing. Now, that's an interesting point because you've recently won an award for a vital sign monitoring application. Can you tell us a bit more about how that came about and what it can do? Mm -hmm. So it all started with a research project as uni at, at university, which was my PhD project. 
and there I developed a radar um, system for measuring vital signs. And it works that the radar system is placed um, in front of a person or behind a person or integrated in a, in a bed and it transmits an electromagnetic wave. This is being reflected by the body surface of the person and then uh, measured by the system. And based on this, we can measure the distance between radar system and the human body. And if you breathe in and out, for example, then this distance will change and the same happens when your heart beats. And based on this, we can then uh, extract the vital signs for respiration and heart rate uh, very accurately. So how is this system different to the way that these vital signs are typically measured in, in a care environment or in a hospital? So typically in hospitals, uh, heart rate and respiration rate is uh, measured with contact-based sensors. So for heart rate, um, everyone knows the ECG. These are the electrodes which are stick to the human body. And there are cables that connect it to a monitor. Um, the disadvantages are obvious, so you're tied to bed when being monitored by an ECG. And um, this is uncomfortable for the patient. And of course, there is staff needed to apply the electrodes to exactly the right spot on the human body. And Imagine if you have a radar system which is mounted underneath the patient bed, as we did it in our trials at the palliative care department. The patient can move freely, he can go to bed, uh, at the restroom, he can go out of his room and have a walk, but as long as he is in bed, as long as he sleeps at night, for example, we can monitor his heart and respiration rate, and then the medical staff can derive important diagnostic parameters. From this. Now, does the technology that you've been developing there rely on a specific uh, semiconductor vendor's chipset, or um, is it sort of chipset uh, independent? Um, so we are not dependent of a certain chipset manufacturer. We are using just the best chipsets for our application. Um, radar chipsets are from the big uh, players, of course. Um, it's good that uh, they are um, common in the automotive industry, the frequencies we are using, so the chips are very well available, we have different options and they are of course also cheap. Now just generally in terms of radar, when we go to the chipset vendors, uh, there's obviously a lot of uh, radar sensor analysis is, is done in software, mm -hmm. but in order to get any data at all, we need some hardware to do it. And the, the hardware is sometimes lacking, there's only maybe one type of antenna design with the chipset. Uh, what are you doing in that space to help people get a better evaluation experience with radar? Mm -hmm. So um, in the future, we will also pro um, we will also have a product uh, for evaluation systems. And the special thing about our radar evaluation systems is that we can change the antennas. The antennas are mounted to the PCB, and they are manufactured by a partner company of us called Golden Devices, also from Erlangen. And the customer can then buy our evaluation module and can place an arbitrary antenna configuration which fulfills his needs in terms of angular resolution, for example. And um, so he is very flexible with our um, evaluation platforms. And they will be launched in, uh, in fall this year. And the vital sign evaluation system is going to be launched in mid-June. Well, thanks ever so much for providing that insight into radar technology. And we wish you all the success in the world with the launch of your products. Thanks a lot. Thank you for the interview. Well, that's about all we have time for in this episode. So, what did we learn? The world of power converters has changed forever. Despite the higher cost of wide band gap devices like GAN and SIC, the new approaches they enable in power converter design result in either lower system cost or capabilities that outweigh the extra expense. In fact, these new FETs are so mature that we're now seeing integrated devices and not just discretes. Sensing 2 is advancing. Clever materials that respond to magnetic fields enable sensors that replace mechanical alternatives. Such progress results not only in improvements in existing applications, but also enables innovation in new ones. Radar 2 is becoming democratised, much like 2.4 GHz radio transceivers, because of the move to silicon. However, a degree of hand-holding remains, but startups like Sikno are there to help. Thanks to all of the experts who took their time to share their knowledge at PCIM and Sensor and & Test. You've delivered us some outstanding engineering insights. 
So that wraps it up for today. If you'd like more of the same, we're broadcasting two episodes of Engineering Insights every month in 2023. And to keep you abreast of industry trends in between this year, take a look at News Bytes, our monthly 15 minute show. Please like, subscribe to Elector TV Industry on YouTube and share our videos on whatever platforms you use. Additionally, you can now drop by the website at electormagazine.com slash EEI to see the topics for future shows and sign up for regular updates and reminders. Finally, if you'd like to join me as a guest, write me an email, drop me a tweet or reach out to me, Stuart Cording, on LinkedIn. Thanks for joining, stay in touch and don't forget to keep asking your engineering questions.